so today I'm going to uh, give an overview of what we've been doing in, in my team at the Liberty Institute for Brain Development. We're called the RY Conductor Power Team Data Science um, team. And it's composed by Luis Cookie uh, Myers, Joshua M. Stoltz, Nicholas J. Eagles, um, myself. And then we work quite closely with uh, Gio Berthea. Um, so you can find the slides on speaker deck if you're interested. And um, on the bottom, you see the team URL. So this is going to be like a quick overview of, of a lot of the things we've been doing uh, in the last year, year and a half, um, sometimes even longer. Um, the idea is that it'll be a bit of a teaser. Maybe you'll get interested. We are always happy to go and present at your uh, team meeting or seminar um, in case you're interested in learning more of the details of the work that we're doing. So we'll start off with like uh, ancestry or really like DNA genotyping, which for that uh, Josh has worked on um, a pipeline called PopTop. And that's because uh, we need DNA genotype data for identifying our brains or um, doing um, expression, expression quantitative trait loci analysis or ETL analysis for uh, further down the road and for differential expression. And so uh, one uh, thing that we've changed over, um, recently is the imputation panel that we use for DNA genotype data processing. Uh, we used to use the 1000 genome abbreviated here as 1000G, we switched to top med. And there's a few, a few different reasons for that. And one of them is highlighted in this plot on the right, which is we have on the x-axis the minor allele frequency. On the y-axis, you have a, a mean empirical uh, square error. Um, and you can see that for top met at small minor allele frequencies, the blue line is higher than the other lines. Um, so that's better in this case. Um, and uh, we could potentially include uh, lower minor allele frequencies uh, filters you know, um, for analysis. The problem is maybe we don't have a, um, uh, that large of a donor pool for this to actually um, affect um, um, the results. But another big portion is that TopMed includes Af uh, populations of African ancestry. And because a lot of our um, donor brains at the Institute are from African ancestry, this is quite important for us. Um, Top-top is implemented as a next flow pipeline, which uh, allows us to parallelize computation expensive tasks um, and automate um, the, all the different jobs in for the data processing of DNA genotype data. Um, it's documented at this website, which is a book um, website. I sh I'm showing the, uh, the current menu on the far right. And it involves a lot of different steps that we won't get into, but like in the end, it creates a BCF file and a BCA file like um, over here, there's a, there's a pretty generic uh, format used for, um, it's called the variant call format uh, for storing DNA genotype data. Um, and so there's a lot of different properties here that you can use for like uh, QC in your data, filtering it. So maybe you're only interested in insertions and deletions instead of large, um, uh, large variants. Um, uh, Etc. So we end up using this file later on in our analysis, uh, but pop top, the main goal is to generate this BCF format. Um, and, and there's always room for improvement. So Gio and Nick are uh, helping Josh with this. And one of the things we want to do is to better integrate it with the um, Libre Data Portal um, <clears throat> uh, and make it easier for people to subset portions of our data such that like uh, in an ideal world, it could be like, hey, I want the genotype data for like this 10 brains, can you give it to me? And maybe it could be done through a website um, uh, without like having to send an actual request to, to people. Uh, of course, DNA genotype data is on their privacy restrictions. So there's some um, security uh, layers involved. Um, and so, um, uh, we hope that you can, if you take a look at the website, 
provide us some feedback, we can improve the documentation of PopTop and make it more user-friendly for you. So next after that, we have um, bulk RNA data. Um, we've generated a lot of it at the Institute. Uh, <clears throat> and so Nick, I'm sorry. Um, Nick uh, worked on something called Speakeasy, which are, is our processing pipeline for RNA-seq. And the idea of why you want a processing pipeline is you want to make the data processing uniform across time and different data sets. You want your uh, pipeline to be documented, to be reproducible. And so you might ask yourself like different questions when you look at process data, like what aligner was used, what version of the genome was used, annotation, um, you would decide to trim or not trim some low quality reads, um, and what version of the software was used. And so there's a lot of different questions you might have about uh, the data that you're getting, right? Um, and we want to uh, minimize as much as possible how much effort it takes to, to, to learn um, how to process bulk RNA-seq data. And so this is our solution. Um, and we want to make it easy for people to, to process their own data. And so Speakeasy has a lot of different steps that uh, we won't get into right now, but the idea is that you go from our um, raw sequencing reads that you get from, from uh, the liver sequencing core or externally, um, or you can even download it from public data sets, and you end up with our objects that are ready for your analysis. Um, so Speakeasy, the code is on that website, um, but it's also has its own long documentation website, which is shown on the right. And it's also being peer reviewed and published since um, last year at BNC Bioinformatics. Um, we also have an, uh, a website with, um, with a full example analysis. Um, and this involved help from Luis and Josh. Um, and so you can see how you actually can use some of the outputs from Speakeasy and do different things with it. Uh, and we even did a boot camp based on this example data. So um, if you're interested in, in learning a bit of some R code for how to use these objects, how to visualize some of the data, uh, you might want to go to that website. Um, overall, we've tried to make it easy for you to uh, run. So the configuration, a lot of it is already um, pre-established. And so, uh, you could potentially only need to run three different steps, like download the code with git clone, uh, go to speakeasy, and then run this um, bash command so you can install all of the software at JHPC. Um, a lot of it's already there. Um, but you can always control um, a lot of different arguments. Um, um, for example, maybe the annotation file that you want to use, maybe you want to use the latest version of gen code, or maybe you want to use the same version of Genco that was used in a particular earlier project. Um, so uh, these example files on the right show how you can do this for, for example, the CMC data set uh, that we downloaded. Um, um, oh. um, so now that we have something that works and established, there's always uh, a room for improving it. So even though it was published last year, there's, uh, uh, we're still working on tweaking some things and making sure that Speakeasy remains um, a viable option for us to use in the future. And so that has involved feedback from Geo again. Um, um, and uh, we've also installed Speakeasy uh, at a cluster in the UK that had different properties from the ones we use over here. This was in collaboration with Nick Clifton. And um, uh, we are always interested in reducing memory or um, data processing uh, required, or I mean, computational power required for processing. So, um, you know, it's pretty easy, we'll keep evolving. Next is uh, still on the realm of data processing. We have BioC map, which is um, again, was implemented by Nick, uh, which is for uh, whole genome by settled sequencing data processing. Uh, so that's DNA methylation data. Um, it's more challenging than RNA-seq data because uh, it's pretty large. Uh, 
you can you might need around two terabytes per sample, which is a ton of this space. Um, um, and that's because you're profiling DNA methylation across all of the cytosines in the genome, which depending on the GC content of the genome could be around half of it. Um, so if the human genome is three billion base pairs long, that's quite a bit, right? Um, um, the idea is very similar to Speak Easy, where we want to generate um, our objects in the end that you can use for your analysis. And we want to keep track of uh, some of the um, output that we get along the way. Um, and also um, um, eventually extract like the methylation proportions. Right. Um, so there's um, this is a bit of the motivation and challenges involved with, with doing this. Um, and in particular, um, one of the uh, best aligners out there for WGBS data is um, GPU enabled. So we had to break up uh, BIAS map into two different modules. The first module can run on a GPU enabled environment. Um, and the second module could run anywhere else. Um, um, so it's actually two different pieces that are, that are quite well connected. And we, you get your R objects in the end that have some tricks in order to be memory efficient. Um, we're working on the manuscript. It's pretty much done. Uh, we are aiming to submit it uh, this week. Um, and uh, there's also the documentation website that is publicly available. Um, so again, if you are interested in WGBS, we invite you to, to look at the documentation website and give us any feedback you might have on it. Um, we also have an example, two example analysis. Um, one of them is shown here using the data from Amanda Price et al., which is, was a Liber Institute paper from 2019. Um, so, Equivalent to the Speakeasy example website, these uh, documents show how you can use these, uh, the result in our objects to make some different plots with DNA methylation data um, uh, that you might be interested in. Um, we've applied it to uh, over 3,000 samples across three projects. Um, so if you think that's 3,000 multiplied by two terabytes per sample, that is like over 6,000 terabytes of this space or six petabytes, um, uh, which is a lot of disk space, right? I mean, this is like the maximum of this space. We, we end up having to delete some of the output files. Uh, but if you've ever wondered why like some disk is getting full, it's potentially because of WGBS data, right? So as you can see, we're processing a lot of different types of data. Uh, and Gio, uh, uh, who joined Libra in 2020, if I'm right, um, has been working on the Libra data portal, which the goal of it is to integrate all the different uh, data sets or data assets that we have at the Institute, uh, linking it to data that we have from LIMS, which is a system used by the pathology group at Libra for keeping track of the phenotype information we have from the brain donors. Um, and uh, it involves a lot of behind the scenes work to make it um, you know, actually technically feasible. And we wanna have a, a, a single web interface where you can do all, the, all of your data queries for the Institute with like layers for security uh, when needed. And so there's a lot of sources of, of data. Um, um, like some of it comes from uh, the pathology team, but some of it could come from actually uh, running um, a processing pipeline. Uh, for example, here, like there's a mitochondrial mapping rate, uh, which you might get for RNA-seq um, experiments. Um, and the actual like counts, uh, that, you, that might be the output of Speakeasy, let's say. Um, so there's a lot of sources of data, uh, um, which are challenging to integrate. Um, and uh, you might want to store them efficiently using, for example, an H5 file system, which is um, memory efficient. Um, the implementation of it uh, uh, right now is based on Postgres SQL, um, um, which the illustration here 
this um, uh, shows like how there's a lot of different tables, how like they all need to be linked to each other. Um, and while how some of them are actually not in a traditional database, they're actually stored externally uh, as data files. Um, so it's not your traditional like SQL database in a sense. Um, eventually, here we have a, an illustration with on the left side, we have um, a, a screenshot of, of the website or like maybe you do a selection for some samples um, across a, a few um, diagnosis, uh, sex and age restrictions that then interacts with uh, um, true node uh, JavaScript, Node.js that interacts with like the backend um, and eventually uh, returns the data that you need to make plots for the on the on the browser for, from the user um, or like export the data. Uh, so there's a lot of work involved on the data portal and it'll keep, um, uh, you might hear from Geo uh, in the next few months. Uh, and I'm sure like this project is gonna keep evolving over time. We hope it will be useful for you. Um, so after that, uh, there's newer data types. One of them is single cell or single nucleus RNA-seq. Most of the data at the Institute is single nucleus RNA-seq because our brains are frozen. And um, this was really pioneered by Matt, Matthew Tran, um, a PG student at the time, now a staff member at the Institute. And um, now involves work from Luis and Josh um, who have been learning from Matt um, and um, you know, processing some of our latest data sets. So a lot of this um, uh, involves also R objects, and in particular, there's this R object called a single cell experiment object. That is a bit of a different beast because single cell data is much larger. Um, you have a lot more uh, columns in your matrix because you have a lot of cells, um, but you also have a lot of zeros because the data is sparse. Um, so you need different uh, tools to handle this type of data. And we, we decided to use the single cell experiment from Bioconductor. And the main reason why we do that is we really uh, like the orchestrating single cell analysis with Bioconductor paper and website, um, which uh, documents how you can use different Bioconductor packages to analyze this type of data uh, with some of the best available methods out there. Um, and the last author is Stephanie Hicks from Hopkins Biostatistics, who we interact with a lot. Um, so let's say you have some data. One of the first things you might want to do is quality control and normalization. And so through reading Oscar, through hands-on experience from Matt and Eric, uh, who is, um, Eric is also a PG student um, at the Institute, uh, we'll be learning how um, we might want to use some of these functions. So for example, uh, we want to run empty drops uh, one sample at a time instead of all of the samples together. We want to use the ESA outlier function to detect bad cells or nuclei. Um, and we've learned some of the parameters that we want to use there. We have also um, learning how to use new tools like the GLM PCA approximation described on a paper by, by Rafael Irizarry and colleagues um, um, and how to adjust for batch effects. And so there's a lot of different steps here and we're um, uh, making progress towards having a bit more of a unified pipeline, but it keeps evolving because new tools keep being published on this realm um, of uh, genomics. Um, and uh, there's always room for improvement. And one of the things we've, we're trying to do for, to improve um, um, the data that we have from single cell is how do you find markers for different cell types? So the top row shows a standard method. Um, and let's say here, we're trying to find a marker for the orange cell type. Um, you can see there's a bit of noise uh, from uh, some of the other cell types. So for example, here, there's a quite a bit of green high up and even at the level of the median from the orange group. And on the bottom row, there's a different strategy that we've used where it looks a lot cleaner. Ideally, we were trying to get to something where it's like awning one cell type off on the rest. Um, but overall, if you have, uh, um, let's say in this case, a log count expression of three, 
you're very likely to be from the orange cell type and not from any of the other ones. And that, not, that might not be the case in, in, the, in the plot above, right? Uh, so that's work with Luis. Um, and it's a perfect segue for the convolution where Luis has been um, the sp uh, spearheading this work. And so what is the convolution? So the idea is that if you have your tissue, um, let's say in our case, a brain tissue, you might do bulk RNA-seq. But that's like if we look at this Lego cartoon from Bo Shia 7 on Twitter. Um, um, it's like, you don't know what is what, right? It's all mixed together. Um, and ideally, if you get estimated single linkless RNA-C proportions, then you like put your different uh, colors in this case or cell types for us um, in their own group. Um, and so um, it would generate single linkless RNA-C, which is more expensive than bulk. We'll, we'll get that type of data. And the convolution uh, is, all in a way, it's kind of uh, getting uh, single nucleus RNA data for free um, from bulk data. Um, however, it's not exactly that because at a gene level, it's not like you can say 40% of these reads came from cell type one, 55 for, sorry, yeah, 55 from cell type two, and then 5% from cell type three, right? It's not like you can get that, um, that level of resolution, but you get, you get it at the, um, um, sample proportion level. Uh, sorry, at the sample level, you get estimated cell type proportions. And so some of our earlier work here was based on data from Tran, uh, uh, Matthew Tran. Um, and it was at a preprint stage where we had five donors and we're checking different methods. We're checking BISC and music using the GTEx data um, and comparing it against a published paper, or sorry, a preprint. Um, called splitter, um, and um, the colors here represent different cell type proportions. We weren't, we weren't too happy with any of these results, uh, um, but after we increased the donors from five to eight, um, we can see a big improvement on the results from BISC, um, and we thought those were better than the ones from music. For example, here, you can see a lot of orange proportions on music, which is the pericyte cell type, which is actually if you look at it from splitter, it's quite rare. Um, so we were like, mm, we, that was a feature from music we were not too happy about with. However, the proportions from BISC, um, if these two green bars are the different types of neurons, are a bit lower than the sum of the green bars on splitter, um, which is something that we think if we had more donors, this would do a better job. Um, um, and so if you compare the, the results from BISC and music and splitter, uh, which is what we do here on these scatter plots on the left side, um, you can see there's, they're quite different. Um, um, and so uh, there's uh, definitely room for improvement, but this is also a pretty challenging comparison because we're using different convolution methods, different RNA-seq data source for the bulk data, different set of marker genes, and a different reference single link to RNA seq data set because the uh, splitter authors basically did not share anything um, at the preprint stage. So it wasn't possible for us to, to do a better comparison. Um, if you look at like what happens if you look at the top 20 genes versus the top 25, uh, BISC is quite, um, the results are, don't change that much, which is pretty good for us music. It's like all over the place and particularly for some of the cell types they change a lot um, depending how many marker genes you use, which uh, made us suspicious of the real results uh, from music. Um, so based on all of these things, we chose to use BISC for now based on the what we're able to explore. Um, and once we chose how to run the convolution, then it became a bit of a factory, you could say. Of, um, there was a very large demand from um, institute members to get access to the convolution results. Um, and at this stage, it hasn't been that long, but at this stage now, some of these results have been used on different uh, published um, um, papers. So there's, for example, the uh, Zandi et al. paper, the Punzi et al. paper, the Benjamin et al. paper. All of them are now using these type of results. And we're, uh, we have different projects that are in progress where we're also using uh, this data. And there's some internal projects that, you know, we had to run the convolution for um, 
uh, for our own exploration of the data that we have access to. Um, so we're not satisfied with our BISC versus music comparison yet. We want to do a, a methods benchmark. Um, and, but for that, we recognize that we need better data. Um, um, and so we need like a gold standard uh, where we can um, best compare the results from the convolution. And we also recognize that single linkless RNA seq is enriched for certain cell types. So in mind, not reflect the true proportions that are present in the tissue. Um, so we're going to use RNA scope, which is an implementation of uh, SMFish single molecule. Um, I forget the acronym. <laughs> it's a complicated one. Um, so that, that's work that we're uh, intending to do. Um, and we're going to, we're not going to do this alone. We're going to do it in conjunction with uh, Kristen uh, from the Libre Institute, and Stephanie Hicks from Hopkins Biostatistics, who have this uh, joint, uh, who are joint PIs on this R01 for the convolution. Um, for, uh, with help from Kelsey, we've generated a very interesting data set in the LPSC where we have uh, spatially adjacent slices of RNA scope, spatially transcriptomics data, um, uh, single lipids RNA seq, and different types of bulk RNA seq. So we hope this, all these data will, will help us um, have a better um, picture of uh, how, how these decomolution algorithms are performing. Um, and for that uh, project, we, were, we needed to choose a gene that we, we were going to use in RNA scope. And so that gave birth to this TREG project, which is the total RNA expression gene um, project, where we want to find a gene that if you look at the nucleus um, and measure the transcription on the nucleus, it is predictive of the um, total nuclear RNA expression. Or um, if you had access to, to single cell data, uh, total RNA expression. Um, so this is useful because it links um, RNA content with the size of the nucleus. Um, and this is different across cell types, which means that um, you incorporate this information into a convolution algorithm, algorithm, you could potentially get um, estimated cell type proportions instead of estimated RNA contribution proportions, um, which uh, we are interested in. And so once you have all of this, then you can move on to EQTLs or expression quantitative trait loci analysis. Um, um, and you, you know, my, you might say like, hey, I want you know, to jump into EQTLs. But before you jump into EQTLs, you actually need to generate a lot of the previous, um, you, need, you, need, you need to run a lot of the previous methods that we were talking about. So you need to have DNA genotype data. You need to have your expression data. You need to have your phenotype data from your brains or samples. Um, and then you might be interested in doing an interaction in EQTL analysis with the estimated cell fractions from the convolution. So there's a lot of different data sources that um, come into EQTL. And so um, we've recently been using TensorQTL that um, has a lot of these, has four main different inputs that come from all of these sources that we're talking about uh, before you can get EQTL results. Um, uh, and we've recently switched from matrix EQTL to TensorQTL. Um, um, we've loved matrix ETL. It's an R package. It was easy for us to use. We started using it um, a while back with like the basic phase two and the stem cell projects with Andrew Jaffe. And um, one of our latest papers from this year um, is the Beep Seek paper, and the bipolar paper with Sandy et al. Uh, however, uh, TensorQTL is uh, GPU enabled, which means that it's a lot faster to run. Um, it's Python based, but um, um, Luis has the skills to, to, to write Python code also. Um, I don't. Um, and we're using it on the MDDC, MDDC project. We know that like um, other teams at the Institute have used it too, um, or like some of the related versions uh, like FastQTL. Um, and um, Andrew Jaffe also told us that like, hey, this might be a good tool to use um, moving forward. Um, the documentation is very 
um, limited. Um, um, you know, you can take a look for yourself. Um, and uh, Nick and Luis figure out how to run it at JHPC using the GPU, um, the GPUs we have there. And they did a R Club presentation recently, um, basically um, 19 days ago, um, on how to do this. So you might be interested on this video. But next, uh, um, EQTLs are not like uh, just a simple thing that you're like, hey, let's get the results and that's it. You actually need to think what's the biological question you're trying to answer. There's different flavors of EQTLs um, and they give you different types of results. Um, and so this great illustration by Luis shows like three different types, the nominal uh, uh, results, which is where you evaluate all of the SNPs with um, all of the genes in a specific window. Um, the SIS analysis where it tries to give you the best SNP in that window. So, um, and then the independent analysis, which is like, hey, maybe we missed some, some interest in SNPs on that SIS analysis. Let's look at conditionally independent uh, SNPs that are also of interest. And so uh, as you go down the list, the computational, um, you get more computationally demanding. Um, and that's why I like having uh, access to a GPU um, enabled software is pretty useful for us. Um, um, and you can see that there's a lot of information on this slide that we can get into the, uh, in more into the details at another session, but you can see how like it changes um, in the time that you need to wait for a result. So you go from um, 51 minutes in this example to two and a half minutes uh, when you're using TensorQTL on CPUs versus GPUs. And if you compare that against matrix QTL, then you go up to like 288 minutes. So you can see how if you compare matrix EQTL against the GPU uh, tensor QTL, you're talking about basically two orders of magnitude faster, which is pretty impressive. Um, uh, and then not only do you need to think about like what is the type of EQTL that you're interested in, you also need to think about what is the type that um, the variance that you're going to provide as input for your EQTL analysis. And you might be interested in subsetting to the uh, variants that have been identified as uh, enriched or or link to a particular uh, disorder or disease or trait, um, and that's simply done with a GWAS um, analysis. Um, so you might, instead of using all the variants that we have access to, you might just want to focus on on a small subset uh, of them, and so that leads to like even more analysis. So you could you could end up with like a lot of t-statistics for EQTLs, a lot of different types of variants, right? Um, um, and because it depends on a lot of different inputs, um, the results can change if any of those inputs change, right? Um, and so one of the last things you can do with EQTLs is like, you might be interested in doing interaction EQTLs with like cell type proportions or diagnosis groups. Um, and so cell type proportions are, uh, continuous metric and the way you can do this analysis is basically fitting three lines uh, for each of the three different genotype options and asking is the slope of these lines the same or not so on the left side we see that the blue slope is different from the green and red on the right one the red slope is clearly different from the blue um, and the green one is in intermediate but not only do they have different slopes, they have also different intercepts, which means different um, points where they uh, intersect the y-axis when x is equal to zero, right? Um, uh, um, this type of analysis, you also want to be careful of, like, you don't want to have a lot of zeros. Uh, um, and so uh, we're still learning how to do uh, this analysis. Um, and these are some preliminary results uh, that you might be interested in. So after that, we move on to QSVA, which um, has been uh, led by Josh. Um, and so QSVA is quality zero variable analysis. Um, and it was initially published by Andrew Jaffe in 2017, I think. Um, and the idea is that if you measure the gradation um, on the bench uh, for some samples and compare uh, the changes in expression associated with degradation against the changes 
in expression observed between, let's say, schizophrenia cases and controls, which is what these plots are showing. Um, uh, there is a correlation on these two statistics. So on the left side, see, here we see like a simple uh, model. Um, and then if you adjust for RIN, um, the correlation is reduced from 0 0.47 to 3.5, but it's still like not zero. So there, the results are still correlated. And this is concerning because you don't know if your genes that you identified as um, differential expressed, like the ones on the top right or bottom left um, by schizophrenia, sorry, uh, left side or right side. You don't know if those are related to actual degradation effects. So that would be the bottom left corner and the top right corner, right? Um, so um, um, if you don't do this, you might, uh, the replicability of your results across data sets might be diminished. And so that's why um, Andrew um, published this QSVA method. Um, and the original process involved uh, um, uh, data from the DLPFC, one brain region, where we obtain data from four different time points. And then using their finder, which is from my PG, um, we would find a thousand express regions associated with degradation. Because um, uh, we didn't really care if it was a gene or not. And so this method worked pretty well because once you find your thousand express regions, you quantify them on your data set of interest. Um, do dimension reduction and generate covariates for your differential expression analysis. Um, the updated pipeline, instead of using express regions, which we can see over here, is based on transcripts because they're easier to quantify. And instead of based on a single brain region, uh, the LPSC or even two hippocampus, it's based on six of them. Um, um, so if, uh, the results are more generalizable. Um, and it's a lot easier to, to utilize for your own data. Um, and so some of the results here show like the overall association with degradation on the x-axis versus the association with degradation observed in each of the six uh, regions. And you can see that like there is a region effect. For example, the LPFC, the slope is steeper than let's say CAUTE. Um, 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 so it's interesting to see the, the variation in association with degradation across the brain regions. Um, you can also uh, use the convolution and find um, estimated cell type proportions and ask, like, are some of these cell type proportions associated with some of these quality security variables? And so uh, typically we found that the answer is yes for that. Um, and you can see that here with like some of the bright color cells on this, on this heat map. Um, ultimately, we've uh, incorporated uh, uh, the convolution uh, results into the QSVA process, and we have a set of transcripts that are uh, associated with degradation um, once you also take into account cell type proportions. And if you look at this BQL plots, the correlation is reduced from like 0 0.09 to like 0 0.05. So it is better. You want it to be closer to zero if possible. Um, and, and we're still working on, on this project, uh, but we're happy to announce that it was accepted into Biconductor um, earlier this month. Um, so the software is publicly available. Uh, we're working still on some of an analysis so we can finish the paper. And we want to shout out, um, give a shout out to Hina who helped us uh, with feedback from the documentation. So once you have all these pieces, you might hear, we finally get to the part you might be interested in, which is differential expression analysis. And Luis has been doing a, a lot of work on, on this area. Um, and again, uh, you need to wait to, to get to this stage because it, there's a lot of different inputs involved. Um, um, you need like the RNA-seq data, you need DNA genotype data, you need the results from uh, QSVA. Um, you might need also the results from the convolution and potentially other analysis. So there's a lot of different inputs. Um, um, and the DNA genotype data, you need it here because we use it for inferring ancestry. Um, so that is like different PCs on the DNA genotype variants. Um, which we find that's, that works better than 
using race as a categorical variable. Um, um, so there's a lot of different inputs that go into the differential expression process. And we, we like to use Lima with Boom um, for actually doing this. And so Lima with Boom involves a few different functions here uh, for normalization of the data, um, specifying your model, and then fitting and obtaining your downstream results. Um, it's pretty fast because it's based on linear regression models, um, but other good alternatives are HR, DC2, and DREAM. Uh, we haven't uh, um, uh, really read too much about DREAM, just a little bit, but we know that like other teams at the Institute have, are, have um, invested more time into looking into DREAM. Um, so all of them are good alternatives to Lima and they provide fairly comparable results. Um, um, and uh, some of these might change a bit on like the sample size of your data set. So you know, it's not like there's a one uh, solution that fits everything, uh, but in general, we, li we like Lima. Um, um, and so you compare it against some of these other methods. Um, BSEQ2, for example, and HR, they use the negative binomial distribution, which means that because there's no direct mass solution, you actually need to spend more computational power to get the results. Um, and so that can mean that like, maybe instead of waiting a few hours for a Lima model result, you need to wait um, uh, a few days for a DC2 result. Um, uh, particularly if you're working with like um, X and X injunctions or, um, or junctions, sorry, or XNs that are like pretty large, right? There's a lot of them. Um, uh, Dream is based on a linear mixed effect model, and it's the author is uh, uh, Gabriel Hoffman, uh, who we know has done excellent work. Um, so it might be more statistically precise, uh, but it's also quite computationally expensive to run. Uh, but of course, we want to learn more about Dream, right? Um, um, and so these some um, these screenshots. The idea is that not for you to like dive into the code, really. But, I mean, we have the link there, but. You can see it takes around 72 lines or so of code to actually run differential expression analysis with Lima. So that's not, you know, pretty short. Um, but a very key input for your differential expression analysis is your model. Um, and so you could use the, um, the explore um, uh, model matrix package from Bioconductor for exploring uh, your statistical model, because this will influence what is the biological question that you're able to answer. You need to do a lot of exploratory data analysis to identify the proper covariates. Um, we have some R Club videos also on, on this, on this um, uh, package. Um, and uh, really like generating all the inputs and then thinking about your uh, exact model you want to run take way longer than generating the results. Right? So, um, uh, and some of it cannot be automated. Right? You, you need to, you need to like explore the data in many different ways uh, and see if you have some batch effects, how you can adjust for them, etc. Um, we've also done uh, models with and without like an interaction for cell type um, 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 uh, estimated cell type proportions from the convolution, and uh, this will change. Uh, the, the results for several of your genes, they'll be you know, overall quite similar, but there are some changes. So some things that were significant no longer are or vice versa. Um, and so this uh, can be important if you're thinking like, uh, do I want to or do I not want to remove maybe um, um, the cell type variation in bulk RNA-seq data when doing this type of analysis. And so um, we're close to the end now, but um, uh, one of the things that we've been doing a lot uh, recently is spatially resolved transcriptomics, and it involves a lot of people, including um, Brenda, Abby, Lucas, Nick, Maddie, Stephanie, Hina, Samia, and other people. Um, and so uh, one of the things we've been involved in is designing the common infrastructure for this type of data. And it was actually accepted yesterday um, uh, into Oxford Bioinformatics. Um, and the, you know, the name of this is called Spatial Experiment. 
um, uh, which we're you know, pretty happy with. Um, and then we made a package for exploring the data, annotating the spots called Spatial IBD, and has a lot of other helper functions. It was actually accepted today into BMC Genomics, so um, you know, pretty lucky streak with back-to-back -back paper acceptances. Um, and uh, Brenda and Abby worked on this example of how you can use Spatial IBD with um, any data set. Uh, and in particular, here we're using a uh, public data set from 10 x Genomics. Um, so we're trying to be, I guess, leaders on this field. Um, and uh, one of the things we're doing is something called um, OSTA, which is very similar to OSCA, which is a guide of how you can use bioconductor packages for analyzing spatial data. Um, so um, we collaborate directly now with Stephanie Hicks uh, for this project if you remember, was the last author of OSCA. Um, we have been exploring different ways of how you can do uh, spatial clustering. One of the tools we're using is uh, base space. And so we found out, even though there's a lot of uh, results shown on the base space paper, we found out different ways of how you can use it that are more appropriate for um, our data, thanks to Abby. Um, and I want to highlight this paper also because we had our preprint on February 29th. Um, 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 uh, of 2020 um, around October of 2020 or so uh, base base came up with a preprint, then our paper was published in February 2021 um, and uh, their paper was published a little bit later um, in 2021 and so because we share our data uh, early on from the preprint stage, um, other people were able to use it and basically pro uh, improve methods. Um, and now we can benefit from those improved methods. Um, so this was very exciting and an example of how if you share your data early, um, you could um, reap the benefits later. Um, plus you get citations too. Um, one of the things you can do with spatial IBD is spatially register your data. So that's compare clusters from single cell data against your spatial data and annotate, try to find like what layer they're reached for. Um, um, Nick is, and other people are helping us with like now figuring out how you can do spot deconvolution, which if we thought that the deconvolution results we showed earlier were kind of like, you know, so so spot deconvolution is like the wild, wild west, uh, I would say. Um, and it's a lot harder for us to say, like, do we trust this method or not? Uh, but in any case, we're interested in, in what the current methods can do. And Tangram is GPU enabled and Python based. So uh, these are two strengths that, uh, um, that Nick um, has, and he's able to help us with, uh, with processing the data with these tools. And basically like also finding out bugs and, and reporting the bugs to the authors and getting feedback from the authors so that they can improve their software. Um, so this, you know, we're basically trying to be on the frontier of this. Um, and so I'm gonna go over, um, um, I'm gonna go over for a few minutes, um, extra just to finish, like what is our philosophy and how you can get help from the team. So, uh, overall, I like the idea of sharing knowledge openly as much as possible. You saw it with like uh, the data that we shared at a preprint stage. Uh, internally, Libre, right? You can see it how we like to share our code through GitHub um, with others. We might even like send you code snippets. We are uh, open with sharing our experiences. We share information on different Slack channels. Um, uh, but like, we don't want to impose a solution for you, right? You can make your decisions and we can we can give you all the context that we know. Um, there's, all, there's always gonna be more stuff than the, than the stuff we are familiar with. Um, so we can give you the information we have, then it's up to you to make a decision. Um, and overall, I would say like my team is, uh, I am an independent researcher and my team acts as such. Uh, uh, we're not a data science core. Um, um, so that's uh, one, like how we're formed, how we behave, uh, but we're always welcome to help other people. Um, and so we can give you some guidance, some ideas, um, you know, brainstorm with you, 
uh, you need to process data. Uh, you know, you're welcome to use the tools that we've uh, created and documented. And we would love it if you learn how to use, run these tools instead of us running them for you. Uh, we also help with sharing data with external collaborators after this has been approved by Rujuda. Uh, but there are things we cannot do for you, which are like lead an analysis um, or develop or maintain a custom software solution that you need or like write your papers, right? I mean, we do that like in our collaborations, but not it's not something that uh, you can expect us to do in general. Um, and we have this data science guidance session system, which you can find more about at this URL. And so we can help you there with questions about, I don't know, JSPC, R, Biconductor, code we wrote, things that, uh, uh, you know, you might want to get some training on. Um, and it works best over the long term if you come and ask us questions um, um, along the way on your project. And, and this is based on my three year experience as a teaching assistant. Uh, sorry, we need to finish uh, soon. Um, and so uh, one of the things we have uh, that we also do for the Institute is uh, our stats club uh, where we have a lot of videos and you're free to join us Fridays at 9 a.m. Um, we post the videos on YouTube, um, which is a way of allowing to multiply ourselves and explain you know, the same thing to other people. Um, 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 so there's a lot of videos you can find there. Uh, and we use GitHub quite a bit uh, for sharing our code, which is we, it's not like we are the only ones using it. You can see here, like there's 73 million people that use it, um, uh, developers. Um, and we have a, an institute account that uh, uh, we would like you to join and use with us. Um, you can email Bill or myself to get added to this institute account. And once you do, some of the things that you can benefit from is like you can search code across the institute. So for example, here you, maybe you're interested in this function aggregate across cells. Now you can search across the institute, find different examples of where we have actually used it. And so this can complement um, the information you get from manuals uh, um, uh, from that are out there describing these functions, right? You can see how we actually use it, how we actually created some of the inputs for the function um, with some of our objects and that they might be similar to the objects you have. Mm. Um, and so overall, we also like to leave uh, some breadcrumbs and of like how we write some code, how it evolves over time. And so this is an example of how like Andrew and myself wrote some code for one project. Then Abby took that code, adapted it for a second project. Then Sonia took it again, adapted it even further. Abby then looked at some of the code from Sonia and updated her code. And eventually this, this could lead to a new function on um, the spatial IBD package. Um, so um, um, it's a very dynamic world um, and we will love it if you could join us in, um, in that world. And with that, I'll end um, and just thank everyone involved, people from the team, Luis, Josh, Nick, um, Brenda, who was with us for a year, um, and then um, a lot of people at the Institute, including Abby, Gio, Lucas, Matt, Stephanie Hicks from Hopkins, Samia from Hopkins, Maddie, Hina, and Will, and many other. Uh, Hopkins, Lieber, and external collaborators. Awesome. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. Um